December 10th is International Human Rights Day. The theme for 2021 is equality, that every person is born free and equal in dignity and rights. Equality is a core value of the European Union, and it's also a value that most of us likely share. At the same time, it's also something of an evergreen theme, even in the EU. Recent years have seen a constant struggle between progressive forces seeking to shape a more inclusive and equal Europe and authoritarian-minded regimes like that of Viktor Orban in Hungary, which seek to divide people based on where they come from, how they look, whom they love or pray to. In this episode, I speak with Marta Pardavi of the Hungarian Helsinki Committee about the current situation in perhaps the EU's least rights-respecting country. Human rights and democracy um, are not only important, but they have become politically very high on the agenda in Hungary. Marta's organization has been one of the most visible opponents of the government, calling attention to its attacks on human rights and the rule of law. Marta and I also discussed how her organization is beginning to use values-based framing. It's a way of talking about issues that people can relate to, and it will make them more inclined to support the underlying cause. Israel Butler is an expert on using values-based framing for human rights causes. He's written a new guide on how organizations like Marta's can grow support for human rights and democracy by adapting how they talk about issues, including things like equality in places like Hungary. Authoritarians will try to find ways to divide us and tell us that certain people are part of our group, and certain people are outsiders who are threatening to our group. Once your audience realizes that people from the groups you're talking about are people just like them, then they'll stop seeing them as outsiders. The human rights situation is worsening globally, and that is why it's important that we hold all those accountable that violate human rights. Islam is the real problem that we face in the Netherlands, in France, in Belgium, in all of Europe. The independence of the judges in Hungary is one of the best in the European Union. <laughs> we need the tripod of democracy, respect for human rights, and respect for the rule of law. Welcome to the Speech Bag Podcast by Liberties, where we look at human rights and democracy issues across the EU. I'm Jonathan Day. Marta Pardavi is the co-chair of the Hungarian Helsinki Committee. She's been a vocal defender of democratic values and civic space in Hungary, resisting the country's slide towards authoritarianism. In 2019, Politico named her to the 28, their list of the top 28 people shaping Europe. Marta, as we sit here near the end of 2021, it doesn't feel like very much has changed in recent years. Democracy and rule of law are still in disrepair in Hungary, and human rights groups are still under constant attack from the government. It's a, a weird time, obviously. A human rights organization or any um, individual who has um, strong views on what is happening in Hungary, I think must have gotten used to uh, having a, a higher temperature in, in our surroundings. This is because human rights and democracy um, are not only important, but they have become politically very high on the agenda in Hungary. This was not always the case, but certainly in the last 10 years, we've seen how this has, these topics have elevated uh, to uh, the top of, of um, political discussions, news headlines. Has Hungary's dramatic shift towards authoritarianism changed in any way what your organization works on or, or how it operates? Any human rights organization in Hungary, I think, was already concerned with making sure that there would be adequate and effective protection for human rights in Hungary before 2010. Obviously, this was always our role and, and the conversation always focused on this, but the methods significantly changed. Before 2010, just to give you examples, the Hungarian Helsinki Committee always found it extremely important to be engaged in conversation with authorities, either through uh, commenting on draft legislation or through a variety of human rights monitoring activities that we carried out. We had, uh, for a very long time, a robust program monitoring detention centers, prisons, immigration facilities, asylum reception centers, uh, police jails. And this uh, the monitoring of closed 
uh, detention facilities was always something extremely important and it was done with the agreement of the relevant public authorities. This was always a, a, this conversation and, and dialogue with, with those who can shape uh, laws and policies was always an integral part of our, of our working um, method toolkit. After 2010, we saw gradually these opportunities disappear. It was not from one day to the next that we couldn't go to prisons, but all of a sudden, in fact, in 2017 in the summer, and that was, of course, after years of very uh, nasty campaigning against civil society organizations. So in 2017 in the summer, one by one, all of these agreements that allowed us to go into detention centers were terminated, I would say on purely political grounds. And so something that we always believed was an important part of our, of our working at um, Toolbox, it was taken away from us. And also, over time, we've seen how opportunities to actually um, make meaningful comments, recommendations, suggestions to, to decision makers and lawmakers in Hungary have completely disappeared public consultation opportunities for draft laws, for example, have really become ridiculous. They are nothing but a, a farce now. And so we also have to decide whether this was actually the best use of our time, of, of, our, of our expertise and resources to analyze and um, make very lengthy legislative recommendations, for example. Simply when the door is very clearly shut, then we have to revisit whether this is the best way to try to achieve change. And so since 2010, we have shifted methods, the strategic litigation, um, advocacy, both towards the Hungarian public and also to um, international or European level institutions have become much more part of our toolkit. Obviously, we cannot change laws, but I think we can change mindsets and we can also make more decision makers realize the, what is at stake. So the way to do about it is probably through diligent um, hard work in advocacy. Um, also in, in um, litigation too, but also in public communication. It's no surprise that the Hungarian Helsinki Committee's monitoring contracts were cancelled. Israel Butler, who is the head of advocacy at the Civil Liberties Union for Europe, says this is a normal strategy for authoritarian-minded governments. And he agrees with Marta that public communication is critical to turning attention to what the government is doing. I think the, 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 the key is to try and keep your eye on what the government's trying to achieve. So why is it that the government wants to neutralize civil society organizations? Uh, let, let's say in this example that the government wants to shut NGOs up because they're very good at calling out corruption and publicizing it, and that's harming the government's popularity. So, you know, then that's where you start as an NGO. You start with, you know, what is your purpose? What is it that you're fighting for? What's your vision of the world? He also shares the view that when a government closes the door on civil society, it creates the opportunity to highlight how important the work of NGOs is. I think that we need to be able to talk about both the issues that we work on and about what role civil society organizations play in making democracy work for everyone. Um, and we can do that by explaining how NGOs allow people to come together and communicate their concerns to their representatives. Um, you know, most people understand that democracy is about elections. Uh, but what I think people understand less is that democracy is about talking to the people that we've elected while they're in power, while they're taking decisions. Um, and that as an individual, your voice is probably too small to be heard. But a civil society organization provides you with a way of joining your voice with others so that polit politicians uh, have to listen to you. Marta, what are some of the ways you've adapted your communication strategy to help make people aware of the importance of your work? One way is um, 
what we've realized is to tell stories and um, try to um, convey um, sometimes very technical, difficult legal notions or procedures through this through the stories of the of our clients, of the people who actually are willing to to you know challenge what is happening to them. Sometimes this is a, a quite a high risk to an individual to be you know standing up for their rights publicly in Hungary, because you can get uh, very nasty social media posts, social media campaigns, or even newspaper articles and other media. Um, uh, slurs against you. So people will not always want to publicly present their case and say, this is what happened to me. I was very upset. There was a group uh, who helped me and we did our best and it wasn't easy, but we won. You've also begun using values-based framing as a way to reach a wider audience and increase support for your causes. Yes, hope-based and values-based framing is something that we have really been experimenting with in the past couple of years um, through collaboration also with uh, Liberties and, and um, other organizations such as uh, Just Labs. And this has really, at least for me, has really been an eye-opening um, uh, experience because it makes us also realize how we have a lot of assumptions and start out you know, from what we know and what we think instead of looking at what our audience or our imaginary audience or our desired audience is thinking and what is valuable for them and what they care about. So it really also wants to to force you to step out of your own sort of mindset and shoes. And this has been extremely helpful for us. And yes, we have uh, really um, learned some very basic but extremely useful practical tips. And then we also see how these, um, the not, the what you should not be doing is uh, out there every single day. So just to give you an example, um, a few days ago, the European Court of Justice ruled that a law which made it a criminal act to assist asylum seekers and migrants in Hungary is against EU law. So you cannot criminalize um, those who assist migrants. They shouldn't be threatened with prison. This is um, uh, the, this should be the, the final end of a very nasty long political campaign that started four years ago in Hungary. And the Hungarian government has actually made a name for this campaign and the law also bears this name. Stop Soros. That's a series of laws that criminalize any individual or group who helps. So it was already in July 2018 that we sent a letter of formal notice to Hungary concerning this legislation, the so-called so Stop Soros legislation, uh, which criminalizes activities that support asylum. Hungary's law to criminalize people and organizations that help asylum seekers was cleverly packaged by the government as a law to stop their favorite boogeyman, progressive philanthropist George Soros. The government's communications were so effective that mainstream news outlets and even EU spokespersons were reusing the government's name for the law, as you just heard. It makes sense that it's pretty difficult to talk about something, let alone refute something, if you're not able to mention that thing by its name and refer to it as other people refer to it. How did the Hungarian Helsinki Committee communicate specifically around this regrettably named law? It was very difficult also for us and for others speaking about this issue to you know, get it right because the, the law was exactly the kind of stigma that we do not want to repeat. So how can we you know, get um, our message across in a way that um, we avoid uh, using this term? And it didn't work all the time, but we tried to, to say, say this, um, this awful stigmatic uh, label in a way that would not be at the very top of our communication. And of course, I also saw many organizations, um, media organizations in Hungary, not having this consideration nowhere near their horizon. 
And so the stigma was repeated over and over again, while the judgment actually said, this should not be happening. It's really difficult, I think, to, to get through, um, through these hurdles where uh, such, such awful labels have become, um, you know, household items in a way, and you want to replace them. Indeed, the law serves as a good example of how NGOs need to always be careful about how they communicate. Israel says that in cases like these, campaigners can follow a simple three-step process to repackage the issue in a way that doesn't reinforce negative frames, but does resonate with the public. This kind of messaging for dealing with smear campaigns uh, that are based on lies, it has three steps to it. So let's imagine that you're an anti-corruption NGO. For step one, you might say, you know, most of us want the people that we've elected to use our shared resources to fund our schools and hospitals. And as activists, we're making sure that our representatives use the contributions that we make to benefit all of us. Um, and then step two, you want to point out uh, the lie and that the government is attacking you. It's important that you don't repeat the lie. You should just allude to it. So you could say something like, unfortunately, Corrupt politicians don't like it when we call them out for slipping public money in their own pockets. And so they attack us because they don't want you, the public, to listen to what we're saying. And then step three of your message is to go back kind of to, to what you were saying uh, in the beginning, maybe just say it in a different way. So you might finish off by saying, you know, we believe that our leaders should make sure that our funds are going to the services that our communities rely on like the roads and buses we travel on and the parks we visit with our families. Um, and that's, it's a, it's a three-step model. It's called uh, a truth sandwich. We've mentioned it in previous podcasts. It's a, a term that was coined by uh, Professor George Lakoff, who's a, a cognitive linguist. Israel also says that making more use of simple devices like metaphors is a good way to engage with people and have your issue resonate. We use metaphors all the time. Uh, so, for example, we use... Uh, an accounting metaphor to talk about morality. Like if, if you do something good for me, I might say that I owe you one. If you do something bad to me, then when I exact my revenge, I might call it payback. And there have been books, whole books written about how metaphors influence the way that we think. Um, and there is a metaphor that activists already use to describe themselves, which is as a, a watchdog. Um, and that gets across the idea that NGOs are defending something from someone. Uh, so it can be a useful metaphor if you are trying to explain to people that civil society organizations protect our rights from governments or corporations that want to take them away. Um, and we can think of other metaphors to get across other aspects of what campaign groups do. I mean, ultimately, to know if they work with your audience, you're going to have to test them. Uh, but here are a couple of, of, of ideas. There are, there are more of these suggested in the guide. Uh, but just to pick out two... Um, there's one that uh, a colleague of ours, uh, Yasha Galaski, suggested. Uh, he suggested a bridge metaphor to explain how um, CSOs make participatory democracy works. And it goes something like this. Um, in between elections, our representatives can seem distant from us. Uh, so we build a bridge between us and decision makers by offering everyone a way of reaching our leaders to tell them our concerns. Um, and just to give you a, another one, uh, we also suggested trying out a, a healthcare metaphor, uh, which goes like this. So um, doctors and nurses help us stay healthy by diagnosing when we're unwell and getting us treatment. We work with citizens to do the same for our democracy by alerting you when there are problems and working together to solve them. Marta, as we sit here now looking ahead to next year, there is a very big election coming up in Hungary. Is there anything that you or your organization is particularly concerned about or, or what are you anticipating will come? As we're nearing the um, general elections in Hungary, it's pretty obvious that there's going to be a lot of extremely well-funded and very aggressive, vile campaigning against um, the, the basic notions of um, dignity and equality um, through an anti-LGBTI uh, campaign that the government slash Fides will be running. And I think this also poses a lot of challenges because um, 
civil society organizations that um, care about human rights issues and equality will, I think, rally uh, together and against this kind of, of, of uh, narratives and campaigning. But, um, but we will have to, and I'm sure we will succeed, but we will have to come up with a way to talk not about what the government is saying, but about what we think is important as a value, as, 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 a, as, a, as a sentiment in society. And so this really um, poses a big, big um, challenge to, to anyone who wants to speak how can you make yourself, you know, heard in a in a a pretty disgusting um, environment by not repeating the the outrageous labels? Israel's guide on how progressive campaigners can improve their public communications is available for download at liberties.eu. That's it for this episode of the Speech Bag Podcast. If you have questions or comments, send them along to podcast at liberties.eu. This has been a presentation of the Civil Liberties Union for Europe.